I just want you to give me some Rombo type advice to get my ball striking back in order, okay? Back in order? Yeah, just just take a quick look and well, tell me. Hold on, how many hours are you practicing? I don't need you asking a lot of probing questions. I just want you to look at my swing and just okay. just fix it. You got it? You world number one. Oh, dog. fix it. What do you want me to say to that? I mean, some feedback. Did you see anything stand out to you as a beautiful I golf swing? What do you want me to say? That was perfect. That's straight. Nice. I mean, what do you want me to say? So you just said that I'm like a pretty good golfer. Oh, well, you just hit three eight irons. I don't know if that translates to the whole. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yo, so check this shit out. Uh, it's me again, still cursing on Callaway Dime. Uh, now, before I get into this episode, let me tell y'all the significance of supporting this content and what it means. It means we can establish a new world where regular people like me can chop it up with legends and ask hard-hitting questions that look to exploit the relationship and architect some, some sort of upper mobility for us, you know what I mean? Uh, and to the Callaway people that are annoyed by this, y'all knew who I was before I got here. You know, uh, y'all think I'm gonna act classy just because y'all treat me good and the answer is nah. Uh, it take a lot more than that to change people like me. Uh, so today's overqualified guest is John Rahm. In a typical fashion, I asked him some questions about what is it like growing up in Spain? How was it transitioning to the States? His most memorable accomplishments. But also asked him some hard hitting questions like, what did he really want to say when they made him quit after that positive COVID test? And what swing tips does he have to get me tour ready in like the next two months, amongst other unrealistic questions. So kick back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Range Talk. Y'all like that? Range Talk. Yeah, I think, I think that's the way we should do it from now on. Mr. Ron, I don't know if I should call you, uh, you know what I mean? John, can I call you Ron, bro? Whatever you want to call me. Whatever you want to call me? Yes, sir. So tell me a little bit about how, how you get that name, Ron, bro. You know what I mean? Honestly, it's, uh, it's just how close my name is to John Rombo. Uh, that's it. So you don't think it was nothing about the way you carry yourself on or off the golf course? No, no I've been called Rombo since I was a kid. Since you were a kid? Yeah, even in school. It's, I mean, it's a worldwide known character, right? So that's why I was called. It's no vice. Plus, in my mind, as far as nickname goes, you know, whether you may like Rombo or not, it's kind of a character that demands respect. Yeah. Scary, it's dangerous. Yeah. So if I can transmit that as well, so it's a you, bonus. So you got that name? There were no like uh, street fights as a kid. Uh, you know, <laughs> no. no, 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 no. I'm not, not gonna go like John Rom, eight years old, beating up little kid like nothing. Well, see, social media wasn't big back then, so no. Probably saved you a lot. I'm of not flat. saying I haven't done it, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you demanded respect, and then you just kind of lived up to the name with these golf clubs, huh? Ah, uh, yeah, that's basically it. That's a story. Uh, I like that. You know, quite quite frankly, when I was a kid, I didn't like it. I don't know. Uh, you didn't like the name Rombo? I don't know why. I just, I never seen the movies. I never understood it. Uh, I just, as a kid, uh, I was very easily, somebody easy to pick on, because I would just get mad. Mm. Uh, shocking, right? <laughs> and uh, but I learned to embrace it, you know? Yeah. I think I got to college here, and uh, I had to develop a thick skin real quick. And, so know, I just decided to embrace it. So growing up in Spain, so you spent a majority of your childhood in Spain, right? All of your childhood. Yeah, yeah. I, first time I set foot in the U.S. was my first day of college, basically. So what was the what was the golf scene like in Spain coming up? Oh, it's uh, it's a little different. You don't have high school team, right? It's all individual, right? You have the Spanish Golf Federation, then basically what will be your state federation, then your county federation, right? So you basically go up to the ranks of different events, different ranked events, and. You play in your local level, you make it to the state level, right. and then national level. Right. And basically just gonna progress the No ranks. team orientation whatsoever. No. Did you play any other sports that gave you kind of like that team environment? You've just oh, yeah. been a lone wolf your whole life. Up until 14, I think I competed in five different sports at the same time. Ah. Uh, yeah. Basically each day of the week in the afternoon was something, right? So got, I was um, something here known as high ally that most people don't know. Yeah. Look it up, <laughs> uh, but I didn't do it. For people that know, there's one that's like a wooden hook. I used the wooden paddle. Uh -huh. If you see, it's it's a very intense sport. Um, it's intense, like, a, like, uh, like physical? It's a massive version of racquetball, uh -huh. okay? Or squash, except the ball is like a baseball. 
and you have to wear a helmet because you can get hit. It's, mm. it's a little, it's a little complicated to explain. So I did that. I did the Olympic canoeing. Okay. Well, I say Olympic canoeing. I think it was K2 is what it's called. Um, golf, goal, goalie and soccer, and I did some martial arts as a kid as well. So how did you know that golf was going, you know, be the thing for you? Were you just dominating at an early level when you said, no. like, ah, I could just... God, no, no, I just liked it. I think I liked the, the fact that you don't need anybody else out there to enjoy and get better. It was all on you? Yeah. You if put you, your money on you and that's what you felt the most Well, no, it's not only that. If you want to practice soccer or other sports, you need somebody to play against for the most part, right? In this that's case... Real. Uh, especially if I'm a goalie, I can't just stand on the goal and wait. <laughs> you could, I mean, depending on your imagination, right? Oh, exactly. Okay. But in golf, you don't need it. It was just you against yourself, and I think that's what I enjoyed uh, the most. Right. Yeah. So, talk to me a little bit about this swing. You know, you got like a, a very, like a unique swing on tour, and I just wanted to know some of the origin story. So, very yeah. short back swing. Yes. And I just wondered, was that just because, you know, as an adult, you figured I need to hit more fairways. Let me just, you know, consolidate the motion and keep everything focused down here at Impact. What's the story behind the golf swing? So, before I got to college and learned why I swing the way I do, as a kid, I had a very strong grip. It was yeah. one of these. Yeah. Over swing and try to just hook, hammer hook everything, right? Like every kid does trying to get distance. Yeah. And my swing coach in Spain, Eduardo, Eduardo Tellez, said, listen, you can't play hitting it this way. I, I play like that though. Yeah, I think we have, some people have made it very far playing like that. <laughs> uh, but I, play, I grew up in tree line courses, uh -huh. I grew up in the forest basically. So it was not working very well. He said, I was kind of going through my growth spurt as well, right? Yeah. So I was like, you know what? Learn how to hit it straight. And he basically forced me to never get past my shoulder height. My, the goal was to have the club aiming at the sky and then swing from there. At what age did you start doing this? 13. 13. Yeah. But at 13, I went, I basically was, I think, 6'2 by then already. So when I get that, getting all that extra distance, he said, you don't need that. You can right. have the distance and control. Right. And that's when I started getting a little bit more precise of the tee, still not the straightest. Right. Uh, there was also a drill we used to make. He, he loved having me like feel like I was taking the club here. Right. Right. And then swing as hard as I could. So it would be something like this. And so just, you could you could you could play with that realistically. Oh yeah. So just he like was, a quarter swing. Without really me understanding, he was making me move my, my lower body. Right. And creating that motion. Now right. that that sport I, I mentioned high lie with a wooden paddle, you do a lot of this yeah. from right here and then you hit it. So yeah. I kind of had those mechanics. It wasn't until I got to college and did all the TPI basically tests with Dave Phillips and Greg Rose where you know I was born with a right club foot. For those who don't know. Oh, because I'm, I'm a part of that party that don't know what a club foot so is. So imagine this is my leg up until the ankle, so straight and my, leg, my foot is 90 degrees left and basically the whole outside of my foot was touching the ground like this. What? So, <laughs> yeah. The process when I'm, when I, I, at that age or at that time was basically I was born, uh, made sure I was okay and everything else. And they gave me to a specialist, broke my foot into place, my what, ankle. How, and this is right out the womb? Like you just- My mom saw me for the first time with the cast on. Yeah. Imagine that doctor's job. <laughs> it's like a specialist. I don't think they do that anymore. But because I was casted so young from knee down, uh, my leg developed slower. I had to go every week to get a new cast because I was growing, right? right, and, right, right. Uh, so I have very limited uh, right foot, right ankle mobility. What does your foot look like now? Is it just? It looks normal. It's it looks just normal? there is a difference between the right calf and left calf, and then from knee down, this leg is almost an inch shorter. So you were already just kind of like pinched in right here, and that kind of facilitated well, like you having the short swing. Yeah, exactly. That limited ankle mobility right. made it so I wasn't accurate because when I was going all the way back. I was not a balance. Ah, my ankle can't, can't sustain it. Right. So when my teacher realizes that, Eduardo realizes if I go from here, I had more, more strength, or at least more balance to get it straighter and actually didn't really lose distance. So uh, he didn't know why, but then when I went to TPI, they explained to me why. And then everything else, my wrists, I have very little mobility this way, Right. but I have hypermobility so what does that way. what does that help for you? Meaning that's why I, my wrist just want to go this way is what's comfortable for me. Right. Right. If I'm playing ping pong, I can create more power this way uh -huh. than I can the other way. So it's uh, it's just the way I'm comfortable, and okay. that's why certain things in my swing work the way they do. That's, that's a, that is a, a excellent story of knowing yourself and, and using everything to your advantage. I'm, I'm proud. Said, of, I'm more proud of you now. You know. <laughs> Thank you. So I've said it in a lot of interviews. You know, you, you 
kind of gotta let your body's I wouldn't say limitations but this is it's giving you guidelines on to what you can or can't do exactly and that's what I say always to everybody to, to everybody who asks about swings or whatever don't try to be perfect yeah. I've had multiple teachers throughout my life tell me I need to get to parallel in a perfect position and I've basically said no since I was 14 to all of them so like I don't want to hey shout out to that wisdom though man just knowing yourself from a very early age you know a lot of impressionable people out here in the world now you know who the best teacher is who the golf ball. <laughs> my boy dropping gems dog well, he, a philosopher or something hey listen is the golf ball going where you go it won't yeah then there's nothing to change there's nothing to change period if so, I was playing good I was up there in the in in best in the country at my age I was like why am I gonna you change spent the most time as the top ranked amateur in like history Yes. Did you know that? Yeah. You probably don't care. Do you care about stuff like that? No, I did when I was in college, of okay. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of my goals. It's uh, one of the reasons why I started my senior year. You know, it's uh, besides me promising my parents that I was going to graduate, uh, I wanted to to have that. Not that record. So talk to me about your transition over to the United States. Wait, so, <laughs> you, so you come in here, you. How old are you at this point? You six, what are you, 17, 16? So I'm from November. So when I got here, I was 17. 17 years yes. old. And you, what, you just get, what, you just say, hey, I'll see you later, mom. No, there was a process. So, <laughs> listen, going on the uh, where I come, I come from a town of 1,400 people in Spain, not very big. Okay. We don't know NCAA rules. Right. And being fully honest, half of them, or more than half of them, make no sense. Uh-huh. Right? I was like, why can't we talk, why can't the coach approach me if they want me at their school? <laughs> I just want to talk to them. Yeah, so I never knew that. I didn't know that we had to approach them. So I was always wondering, I was top five, top I was 15th in the world rankings. Right. I'm like, how do I have no offers? I'm like, I see all these guys that are worse than me that have offers. Right. How am I over here just, uh, you know, getting nothing? And my first offer came from, I was representing Spain on a team event on the European under 18 championship. Okay. And I saw a guy that had a shirt that said San Francisco. My grandma had just been to San Francisco in summer. So I was like, oh, my grandma has been there. Right, with my English that I had at the time. I was like, yeah, it's a great place. You talk great about it, blah, blah, blah. And the guy decides to follow me, uh -huh. right? And shortly him, after, they decided to give me a scholarship. And I'm like, oh, this is great. Finally have an offer. And then they made a mistake with my age because I'm from November, from November. They thought I was a year younger than what I really was. And they wanted me to see that a year in Spain. So uh, during that, one guy from Spain that was supposed to transfer from Iowa State to Arizona State decided not to. Uh -huh. And Coach Mickelson heard about me and said, well, I'm gonna give this guy a chance. My stats were good, my rankings were good, and never met me before, never spoke to a word to me. <laughs> they offered me a scholarship. So it was just like a blind date, you coming over here. This is, by the way, May, and I came in August. <laughs> like, I had never been to the US, never talked to Tim, never, I had no idea. And like my dad always says, yeah, we did the process. I dropped him off at the airport. He's like, I don't know if you made it to Moscow, Singapore, or Phoenix. <laughs> I said bye, and, and uh, you know, here we are. And you will come, and let me, let me see you switch clubs for a little bit, too. Yeah, I mean, true, let, me, let me see you hit something a little bit longer. But you were okay with that, you know what I mean? You're 17 years old, you like, I'm ready to take on the world. I need to see what, you know, what's going on yeah. over there in the States. Well, so, I left my house to a golf academy when I was 15. Oh, so you, you've been in the game. So, I mean, it was a little bit more daunting because it was a new language, but right. um, it was something I was excited about. I think it helps when you have no clue what to expect. Exactly, it does. Because then you like super open and aware, you taking in everything, exactly. you paying attention, super present, right? It was hard at first because way of life is different. And obviously some of these language barriers too, right? Yeah, and I'm gonna be honest. Uh, basically with the Spanish Federation and having been a top player for such a long time, I've been spoiled. Right. Okay, I have a lot of things done for me and this Golf Academy I went to, we stayed with where the Spanish, basically in the Spanish Olympic Village. Right. So everything was down for us. It was like a hotel. Mm. So when I came to college and I saw it was a bit more of uh, every man for themselves. Yeah, you gotta fend for yourself, man. Not that I didn't mind it, not that I cared about it. You I just had Rambo. to. You full blown Rambo at this point. You didn't care. Yeah, I, had to, I just had to learn. And then the language barrier was the, the main thing. Yeah. You know, that first month, having to pick up a lot was the tough part, but the good thing about it is that I could always kind of come here, come to the golf course, and do what I'm supposed to do. Exactly. So that always helps. Like less people talking to you. 
it's almost like well as long as i was beating my teammates i know i was gonna be all right so yeah. that, that was <laughs> that was all in my head having language barriers is like having permanent headphones in, you know what i mean yeah. you always got an excuse not to speak to people i always say i didn't understand one single joke from my whole freshman year that's unfortunate and i couldn't make a joke for another year after that because there's a lot of things i had to learn i didn't want to offend anybody exactly I think that that's something that you got to worry about, even if you know perfect English, actually. So. Yeah, I read it over there, you know, I just didn't want to. So talk to me. They said that, uh, you know, you use some hip hop. I'm a big hip hop person, if you couldn't tell, if you weren't making it, you know, split judgments. I'm a, I'm a huge <laughs> hip hop no person. I'm no one to judge. I'm a huge hip hop person. And they said that you kind of use this as a language development tool of sorts. Yes, not on purpose, though. Not on purpose? Yeah, not on purpose. So this all started, one of my teammates, one of those people that just knew every single lyric to every single rap song out there, uh -huh. right? And I think I started listening when Kendrick dropped uh, Good Kid, Mad City. Ooh, that's a good album to learn English to, dog. Well, that was the first really rap album I listened to. Uh-huh. And uh, on the song Backstreet Freestyle, two of my teammates, while we were in Hawaii, were trying to learn the fast part. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, that's cool. I want to do that. So I started memorizing songs. Could not tell you at that time one bit of what I was learning. <laughs> I had no idea what I was saying. I had no clue when I could say certain words because there's a lot of cuss words that I had no idea were cuss words. And I'm there just talking to my coach like, oh my God. It's, it's like, yeah, John, come on here for a second. Uh, no, I can't say that in class. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, and then uh, after a while, I realized that being able to, it was almost like a pronunciation tool, right? yeah. like a, maybe an actor would do to warm up. Being able to say that so fast kind of helped my thinking, my thought process, my speaking process, helped me keep up with conversations better. Man. It was later on where I learned uh, a little bit of what Kendrick was talking about and certain things. And even to this day, if I hear some songs on the radio, I still can't understand the, uh, the words. I just have a hard time still to separate with the music and all that. That's still After dope, nine man. years, I still have a hard time. But that's still dope, though, that we found like we found more uses for hip hop and golf. You know what I mean? I think. <laughs> I love the, when they say I learned English. I'm like, listen, I wouldn't have gotten a degree if, you, if I learned English yeah, like yeah. that. You would have got a degree in my neighborhood, but you know that's neither here nor there. Uh, so talk to me about meet your wife in college. That was another yeah. big part of this, right? Did you know that it was love at first sight, or were you putting everybody through a rigorous application process to get some of your time? No, 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 God, no. I'm a very laid back guy. Okay, but, all right, so all we right. met freshman year and we started dating senior year. Uh, she was javelin throwers, a track and field, and a bio, biology pre-med major. So Way a, a lot busier, you know, by far. A lot busier than I was, really. Yeah. My communications major they didn't take that much <laughs> of my time. But so we met at a track and field Halloween party. Okay. She had probably the greatest costume I've ever seen, and I didn't understand that she was a replacement ref. <laughs> what? The NFL replacement ref. So she had a referee outfit on right the black the black and white stripes uh -huh. and she was walking around with the blindfold and the like the blind person stick and throwing <laughs> flags at people because of how bad a job they were doing right uh -huh. at that time no idea when she explained it to me i'm like this could be the smartest <laughs> this one, of the, one of the best costumes i've ever seen and uh we talked then and then you know, as athletes, we saw each other and, and you know, study hall and things like that. We just right. never really started dating because uh, I was dating somebody in college and she was dating somebody else as well. And at one point, uh, one of my teammates is funny, just saw her on the bike. And she was just, you know, stopped right in front of our apartment building. She said, hey, just come upstairs, say hi. You know, she spent the afternoon with us and some of the teammates, some of her friends, and we went to the football game the next day together. And we both know that's kind of how it all started. And, uh, Sparks was flying. Yeah, that was fall of uh, 2015. You remember your first date? I don't think we actually ever really had a first date. It's one of the weirdest things. We just started hanging out. We started like blending together. Yeah, we. She says it's that football game, but I don't know. I never really said like I never formally asked her on a date. Did you formally ask her to be your girlfriend? I formally asked her to be my wife. Mm. That's, <laughs> That's, I so spent a lot of time in the gray area. No, 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 no. I mean, I didn't formally ask that, but we just hanged out, right? Like, hey, you want to meet? You want to do this? We 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 used we used to go happy hour to this place called uh, Z Texas. Uh -huh. We had a great trio, which is chips and walk and queso yeah, yeah. and salsa, and that's what we would have. She basically we have a margaritas. I wasn't of age yet in the U.S., mm. <laughs> and I would just be eating. All right, shocking too, right? <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, that's how we started hanging out. So, and then you were, 
were you being a pretty chivalrous person? Because this is rumor going around that, you know, you was kind of struggling in college uh, on the financial side. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I heard that maybe she had to treat you to some things. Who told you this? Who I'm told not, him this? I'm not. I'm just saying, I just asked around because I knew I was going to spend time with you. I wanted to know where I could take you. You asked her, know? right? Okay. Yeah, you definitely asked. So, yeah, there, there was definitely... If my teammates ever get you, they ever tell you I got mad in college when we had chipping games or putting games, it's because it's $5 can make a difference <laughs> in my bank account, okay? I, uh, there was many nights where I would go to the, to the to study hall just because I'd have dinner out of a vending machine. <laughs> this is straight, straight true. I'm not uh, laughing at you, it's just it's relatable, you know what I mean? Oh, I would go down to the football, well, to the gym. I figured out a way to sneak into the gym when it was closed and get, uh, get Gatorades, get the protein shakes, get something to eat right. when I know I couldn't afford it. And once, I would never tell her. Like, I would spend all my money I had when I was with her. And once she found out, I don't know how she found out, uh, she wouldn't let me pay for anything else. And, you know. You almost, uh, you got to marry her at that point. That's wifey <laughs> material. No, but she, she understood as well. I don't know who told her. I don't know how she found out. But, uh, but yeah, there was times where, you know, if I didn't win that chipping game that day, <laughs> But Just $10, you, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. But, you know, you, you probably look like a good investment at the time. You know what I mean? Once we figured out, you know, how good you were and, you know, all she this. She thought I was the worst on the team. Because you were just, you were staying super low key with it. You just wouldn't even, you well, wouldn't you even know, show no some emotion. Well, you know, some people are more vocal than others. Yeah, you just like, oh, golf is okay. Like, whatever. Uh, you by probably the way, didn't have the words to express what was going on on the golf course. That's uh, probably was the issue, right? Well, she had no idea about golf. Mm. And... The first time she came to watch an event, she realized I was the best in the team and one of the best in the country. That, that's when she realized, and that was I senior year. Deal. Yeah, I had already finished Faith in Phoenix, uh -huh. okay? Like I already had done a couple of things. And yeah, she, I remember this, we were watching, one morning, we were watching the morning drive, and um, they were talking about, oh, who's the next amateur to maybe win an event, right? Right. And my name comes up, it's like, oh, I think Josh, she's talking, it's like, like, they're talking about you? Somebody said I'm your like, name yeah. that sounded like your name, but it's not your name. But so it, it, it was Phil's, team, I so. think it was Phil's 25 year anniversary on his win in uh, when he was an amateur, right? right. I think this was 2016, because I think he won in 91. And and my my name came up and he was like, she, she was like, are they talking about you on TV? Like, yeah, so it's just they, once he heard what they were saying about me. Humble. You just like, yeah, that's me. You know, yeah, so at that point I had two top tens in the PGA Tour as an amateur. And, uh, that's when I think she realized. And then she started buying your food for you. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, she already done it at that point. <laughs> All right, let me see you hit something else, man. And yeah, talk to me, so like, you, you know, you done obviously accomplished a lot in golf already. You know what I mean? We talked about your amateur, you know, standings. Mm -hmm. We talked about now you, you know, world number one, no pressure, you know, uh, open US Open winner. So what's some of the things that stick out to you the most about what you've accomplished thus far? Any highlights for you? Like, oh man, I was so proud of myself when I did this. Maybe it's not something that everybody knows. Listen, uh, I'm forever gonna say now, one of the highlights of my career, okay, was, and I don't know what possessed me to deal with this the way I did, Yeah. but how my mind processed Memorial and the COVID positive yeah. would always be one of the things I'm the most proud of. Within I how- I, I needed to ask you about that too. That that was that was crazy to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, how I could have looked at it and how I could have basically act like a victim and say a lot of things I could have said and just excuses I could have made, I didn't. I don't know what possessed me, maybe being a new father and trying to set up an example or whatever it is, uh, maybe trying to stay tr strong for my family, whatever it was, uh, I never did, you know? I, I'm gonna be honest, I got to the score intent after they told me Threw a bit of a fit. I was pissed, mm -hmm. okay, as you should be after yeah. that. But it was five minutes. Afterwards, I realized I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm leading this thing by six, whatever, six, whatever yeah. I was. I just played one of the best rounds of my life. Don't want to let me play. That's fine. In my mind, I'm winning. And you, and you left. In my mind, I won. I'm playing good. The U.S. Open is about to come, and then I switched to well. You know, my family's health. I'm like, we have a young son, my wife. I was like, that okay, was then nice. my my priority changed. So that's I think that was. Probably one of the biggest things I'll ever do. Cause I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, if they would have did that to me, it's no way they would have got me off that golf course, dog. 
I mean, they're gonna have to put me in a hazmat suit, let me play by myself in the morning. Like, I'm thinking about all the ways, like y'all not about to take my money like that. It's <laughs> like, it's like when, I don't know if you've ever been fired from anything, uh, probably not. I'm gonna just go ahead and say you haven't been. But, I haven't you know, had many jobs. You haven't, that's fair. You know, you you a plan A type person, you know, but uh, it's kind of like getting fired after you work the full day. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's what it felt like. Yeah. It felt like, you know, uh, you know, that's y'all fault for not knowing this late in the game, but I'm, like, I'm whooping ass right now. You got to let me finish what I started. As a man, I got to finish what I started. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I wasn't upset. I, like I said, in my mind, I won. Kudos to you, dog. That's kind of what I, I was gotta, like. I, gotta, I, gotta, I was watching the next day. You know what? I'm like, let's see if at least they get to my score. And they nobody would have beat you. If you would have just cashed in right then. You could have shot four over and still, and still win. So... Yeah, in my mind, I won. It's okay. So I, I, I've been meaning to ask you this too. Did you hit up the person that won and tell them that they needed to send you the check? God no. That's what I would have did. Like, how you sleep at night with my money in your bank account? You know what I mean? Well, he has to sleep at night knowing that he's not the real winner. You're not the real winner. That's whatever it is. You don't leave no voicemails or nothing. No, no. Listen. You're not that type of. Okay. Okay. No, okay. listen. Patrick played great golf. Uh, okay. Okay. Listen, what happened to me happened. This is sports. Right. I got a lot of people calling me and giving me examples of things that happened to them. Right. Nick Fowler told me a great one. So it's like, you know what? It's what it is. Uh, I am pretty sure he would, whoever would have won that week would have traded that win for the US Open. Right. No disrespect to Jack. He would have traded that too. Right. So uh, I would say things worked out really well for me and I'll get my chance. It's okay. Two years in a row I've played in that golf course and two years in a row I've had something happen. Exactly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to playing with, uh, you know, events free week and hopefully win it. <laughs> All right, I feel pretty comfortable with you now, so I'm ready to show you my golf swing. I don't want you to hit drivers. No, no, I, I, just, I, just, I just need you to give me some, you know, you gave us some pretty uh, astute advice about swinging within ourselves. Yeah. I just want you to give me some Rombo type advice to get my ball striking back in order, okay? Back in order? Yeah, just just take a quick look and well, tell me. Hold on, how many hours are you practicing? That's that's neither here nor there. There we go. We'll see. That's uh let's let's be realistic okay. <laughs> about what Juan wants to do. I don't need you asking a lot of probing questions. I just want you to look at my swing and just okay. just fix it. You got it? You world number one. Oh dog. fix it. Alright. I can play. I don't know if I'm the best teacher. What do you want me to say to that? I mean, some feedback. Did you see anything stand out to you? As it's a beautiful like golf on? swing. What do you want me to say? That was perfect. What did I say earlier? The teacher's the, be the, the best teacher is the golf ball. So if I don't hit a bad shot, then... There's nothing to change. But I'm inspired being in your presence. Let me just hit one more real quick. <laughs> let me just... Let me just, let me just. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, first, you need to warm up a little bit. <laughs> You've been just standing. But I mean, but is there anything standing out to you that I... Like, just fundamentally. I, listen, fundamental. I'm not going to be able to do it in two swings. But you the world number one, dog. That don't carry over into how you talk to people? It doesn't mean I'm right. Okay, I'm going to just show you one more. Just... Uh, that, so that's being world number one give you I guess I'm, give me some extra credibility? A hundred percent. Okay. See, you I can tell aware. me to take one shoe off right now. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Man, you better be cashing that in. <laughs> what do you mean to say to that? Perfect. That's straight. Nice. And, I mean, what do you want to say? So you just said that I'm like a pretty good golfer. You You're kind of acknowledging golfer. that right here, oh, yeah, right man. now. Oh, you just hit three eight irons. I don't know if that translates to the whole. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to see what I could go back home with, so I could brag to my friends. Hey, that was really good. I mean, listen. What do you want me to say in that sense? That was those three great shots, without really being warmed up. So you a fan? I like. Of my, I like you the a tempo. fan of mine. There's a lot of things I like, man. It's great strike. Like great tempo. I can tell you're dialing back because. It's a lot more in the tank. Yeah. Which I know that can be the problem. So. Exactly, exactly. I'm trying to learn from you, dog. Well. So if you don't have no critiques, we just gonna move back over here because I don't need you to find nothing bad to say. Uh, no, if you want critiques, ask Fels. He's gonna, he'll give you something. So. I won't. So let's let's talk about the US Open real quick. Though. Yes, sir. That I know that that meant the world to you. Won it on Father's Day. You know, you had just went through what you went through at the memorial. Yes. And so talk to me about, talk to me about how you, uh, like what that meant to you. I know you probably answered this question a million times, but it's all right. I'll yeah. gladly do it. Yeah, but just talk, talk to talk to me about what that meant to you. You know, I think to finish the way I did, okay, those two putts, um, and then to stand on that green, 
I might get a little emotional, but stand on that green when I got my first win with my dad there. Right? Mm. My dad was there. It's Father's Day. Mm. My parents met my son six days before that. And again, there's three generations of Roms standing on that green. It's hard to explain. It's hard to explain. Um, you know, after Memorial, I told Kelly, you know, something big is coming up. Something big's gonna happen. I don't know what it is, right. but after this, something big is in store for us. I right. didn't know what it was, and you know that happened. Obviously, that was it. And it's very hard to explain uh, to get my first major like that, at such a special place for my family with my parents there. I think that was that was the first time my mom saw me win in the U.S. Personally, mm. and uh, to do it like that, it's you know nobody really ever usually birdies the last two holes of a U.S. Open to go on and win, right? And That was special to see, man. I was able to do something very unusual. And, you know, if I'm going to be picky, if I'm going to get a major, I want to be uncommon in the way I do it, which was kind of that way, I guess. And I'm a big, I've always been a big fan of the U.S. Open because it's like really, oh, you yeah. know, it's everybody's tournament. Everybody has a chance to play. You know you got the best of the best. You know, you the do. people that are there are there for a reason. They there, they trending, you know what I mean? And, Every uh, major, you have the best players in the world, but right. when you play in the U.S. Open, it's a different beast, you know? For the most part, the golf course is set up in a way that it's gonna be somewhat of a bit of torture. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's gonna be long, it's gonna be drilling, and you're gonna have to find it out. And, it's mentally quite a bit more taxing than any other week, but that's the beauty of it, right? You don't you don't only find who's playing the best, you find who's the strongest that week. Exactly. And I think that's why everybody who ends up winning the U.S. Open, you have a little bit of it's some strength that you need to have to be able to win it. Right. Not discrediting any other majors, but you know, it's a different type of endurance yeah. that you gotta have. And there's some of them where they win with you know high scores over par. Those are the top ones. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of watching those. I like seeing y'all light it up a little bit. Me Man, I love watching the bogeys and doubles. Yeah, because you probably don't see it that often. Well, That's no, because I, I watch them to. and, like, you know, I know how you feel. Yeah. Because sometimes you just feel useless because it's so freaking <laughs> difficult. You miss a shot by this much and you're looking at rough and you're like, what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Sit down. Exactly. After this one, let me see you hit some drivers, man. Mm, let me on. see that thing. There you go. Hey. A little straight. That was nice. So. I mean, I know Am I the you. only one who shows up to the range without tees. I got you, dog. Yeah, I know. I'm, I actually, I'm, not, I'm very underprepared. I, don't got you. I got one for you. Don't say thank I never you. did nothing for you. Dog. Oh, you're doing a lot already. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. I need that acknowledgement. So, talk to me about transitioning the fatherhood, man. Mm. I know that this has been like huge for you as far as how you transition yes, sir. personally, how you handling things professionally now. What's this been like? It's been wonderful, honestly. Um, I feel like I'm one of those few marriages where I, I was ready more and before my wife was. Mm. Uh, I feel like, I've always felt like I would be a good dad. I'm a responsible person and I know I could be a great, I'm going to be a good role model for my son. But, you know, when the real thing comes along, it's a bit different, right? I mean, he's born, you live in the hospital and you're kind of like, all right, what are the instructions, right? Exactly. <laughs> where, where's the, where are the guidelines saying? A little bit you gotta learn, but it's it's been fun, you know? It's, uh, it's made me look at myself in a very different way. And it's helped me because when I finish my round of golf now, the tournament, not that it ever takes me long to get over it, it takes me even less now, whether it's good or bad. Because... That's disgusting. When he sees me, he doesn't care who I am golf-wise, what right. I've done, what I've shot, or what I'm gonna do in the future. Right. He just wants that Daddy. and he wants to play. And that could be the greatest gift uh, that, you know, that I could have ever love. given. Yeah. And he's going to get it from me. That's the greatest gift I could have ever been given. So, Somehow a break from this. Exactly. And then did that, that kind of like put things in perspective for you and kind of got you to dial down a lot of things about how fiery you approach the game, right? I'm still just as fiery as how I process it that's changed. Mm. You know, because that is what is my competitive aspect. That's that's you. Yeah. So talk to me about choosing not to play in Dubai. Well, that was not a good swing. Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> like please turn you... off the pro tracer on that one. <laughs> I know you just want us to feel more comfortable in your presence. Like, well, I'm not a robot all the time. I am not, no. Uh, it's, been, it's been long, you know. Since we restarted from COVID in June of 2020, I, I didn't really stop. Till after the Spanish Open, right. I 
when I had the time off in December, I switched to Callaway. Mm -hmm. And congratulations on being part of the gang too. You know what I mean? It's a pretty good decision. It's I'll a say. good decision. Great uh, choice. Finished the masters. I flew back Sunday night. Spent Monday here. Tuesday I went to, to San Diego and worked three, four, five days basically sunrise to sundown. Right. I was gonna get everything right and I worked as hard as I've ever worked during that off season to make sure when I teed it up next on the following season, I was ready. Right. I didn't want the clubs to be an excuse. Right. Uh, and they worked, you know, it took good. The only thing that took me a while was to find a putter. Right. Uh, but everything else was working great. You know, I was getting top 10 after top 10 after top 10. I knew at some point it was going to click and it did. That's awesome. But so, what comes with playing that good all year round is you're in contention a lot. Right. And that's what happened to me in summer. I was won the US Open, in contention in the Open, in contention on the playoffs, in contention on more events, and then the Ryder Cup. And didn't have enough time off, went to Spain. Spain is a very, very taxing week for me, both of them, because of what's expected of me a little bit, the crowd, the intensity, the media. And after that week, my head was not good. Right. Uh, then, I, even if, even though I had a month off, it just didn't feel like enough. Yeah. You know, I know in the future when my son's older and our family is older, I know I'm not gonna regret the tournaments I played or the tournaments I didn't play. Right. Right. I'll never regret not going somewhere because I decided to spend time with my family. Right. It's limited. Once they start going to school and they have the time off in summers when I'm playing the most, I know I'm gonna miss a lot. Right. So. I'm gonna take advantage of that, and it's the happiest I've ever been. I, I love that, man. I cannot say, yes, I gave up a week where a lot of things could have happened, but the feeling I have when I'm giving my son a bath at 6 a.m. beats that. So that's where I made the decision from, and uh, I don't know if a lot of people maybe understood, but I, understood. I needed it. I understood, you know what I mean? Let me see you a more. There you go. So. I like to end these segments with giving people opportunities to be charitable, you know what I mean? Uh, and the charity that we're trying to support today is the Roger Steele Foundation. So the, the opportunity that I would like to extend to you is, uh, would you like for me to be your partner in the Zurich Classic? You saw me stripe three eight irons over here, <laughs> and I just, wanted to give you, I just wanted to give you the chance now to jump on this. Because I'm kind of like you in college, like I'm budding a little bit, you know what I mean? I, I don't know how the scores to prove it, but I, you can feel my energy. You open to it? <laughs> I'm open to anything, that's for sure. I'm not, uh, if I'm being honest, I don't know if that tournament's in the calendar this year. Okay, well, what about the Pebble Beach Pro-Am? No, it's definitely not in the calendar this year. Okay, uh, what about getting you to come to Chicago for like a money game scramble or something like that? Come to Chicago for a money game? You're already here, we can do that here. Uh, can I get an autograph? Like, which is you? you want Listen, to you get something. That's for sure. I, we can we can work on whatever you want to do. Let's just not do uh, playing a PJ Tour event. Oh. <laughs> well, it's kind of hard because Zurich. I have one with Ryan Palmer. I know, man. Right? I know. So, I just wanted to see how much we bonded right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, I'm a good sport. Hey, let, let's not let's not say let's not make a decision that can affect my work. All right, we don't you don't right? want to rush things. Right? You don't want to rush I mean, things. No, it's okay. Unfortunately for you, I deal well with rejection on camera, so you know I'm gonna go ahead and eat that one. Let me see you eat. See here one more. See if I can hit a draw for all those people that say I can't hit a draw, huh? How about that? There you go. Oh my God! And with that, I'm gonna just shake your hand and hope that that rubs off on me. <laughs> it it always does. Hey man, just a little bit. You. I appreciate you. Thank you for oh, the time today. Thanks, man. Roger. So there you have it. Rombo, handling the pressure like a pro. Hitting the ball as straight as his face when you ask him for a favor. Uh, that dude, he he's something special. Uh, something I'm taking away from this is perspective. Knowing how to compartmentalize emotions and the beauty of love and fatherhood and how it could turn the most fiery man into a, a smarter but still very fiery man, I guess. Uh, we also learned how a good playlist can help you overcome language barriers and that the only barrier to your game might be you not letting the ball be your coach. All those balls we hit in OB, they not accidents, people. Those are coaching sessions. Pay attention with your trash self. Uh, shout out to Ron for hosting us at Silverleaf. And remember, if y'all ever need any more honorary members, I'm definitely your guy. Yeah.